leaders in healthcare. Uh, Microsoft, who runs most of uh, the, uh, the the health IT infrastructure for just about every life science health plan and hospital in the country. Uh, uh, Don, thank you for heading up the next conversation and I will jump off camera. Great. Welcome everyone. And David, thank you for, uh, for joining me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Good to see you again, Don. Uh, absolutely. Well, uh, let's just jump in. And, um, you know, I, I knew you uh, when you uh, were chief medical officer of Samsung, a hardware company, and now you've joined a software company. I was kind of curious as you've seen the transition, how, how, how does that impact your thinking to go from hardware to software? Well, I think in many ways, my, my journey has been the journey of healthcare. Uh, I actually started before joining Samsung uh, in the traditional realm of EHRs. Um, and, and even that was for me, something that I had not anticipated. Uh, my goal was really to find ways to address issues around variation of care. Uh, and as I started looking into the whole concept, I realized that uh, variation of care oftentimes is unnecessary, unwarranted, leads to waste and uh, decreases in quality. And, and obviously uh, there's ways that we can address that. One of the most efficient ways was through clinical decision support. Uh, I used to run clinical studies uh, that would show if you provided the right information at the right time on paper, uh, using uh, individuals as the vehicle, you could actually enable significant improvements in care but that was non-sustainable. So we integrated that into electronic health records and that, that ended up becoming the first vehicle. Now, as we're all well aware, uh, EHRs have a great benefit in hospitals and clinics, but as soon as that patient leaves the hospital clinic, they're no longer able to take a full advantage. And, and largely it's really based on just a certain group of people taking advantage of the digital. So the patient and the consumer were really being left behind. And, and that was for me, the turning point of, hey, you know, I, I need to start looking beyond what's, uh, I'll say the traditional role of health IT and, and look at mobile technology sensors and things that the patient and consumer can be much more involved in. And that started my journey with Samsung and a variety of other uh, digital health initiatives. But I'll tell you where we've gone as an industry now is, is to the point where the data is becoming much more interoperable. We're removing those barriers. We're allowing us to be able to leverage cloud and, and AI, which has always been a dream, is now being a reality. Uh, and that's when I uh, had really kind of made the move to look at where I think the next great opportunity is, which is around cloud computing, AI, and, and being able to apply this to improve outcomes for all of us. Um, you know, interesting at, uh, at Microsoft, Microsoft obviously had teams uh, on, uh, on its platform, but um, obviously the pandemic has, uh, has shot it up in terms of its both practicality and usage. And at least from my experience where I live on some form of teleconferencing all day long, it's, it appears that uh, teams and Zoom have, have the majority of the, uh, of the market, uh, market share. And I'm just wondering, um, how has that impacted Microsoft and Microsoft operations and the attention that that one product has within the company? And where do you see it going? Do you see, do you see more resources going to make Teams even more valuable than a, than a teleconferencing platform? Oh, absolutely. And, and really, it was just a starting point. It was almost filling that immediate need. Somebody needed or organizations needed tools to be able to communicate digitally. Uh, and it was the right tool at the right time. But we've been thinking quite a bit about you know, how vid virtual care and how these technologies can be built to enable a much more seamless experience that uh, can encompass even more than just the, a, a duplicate of an in-person visit, but represent an opportunity for us to start thinking about how we can reinvent care. And as we think about you know, the, the technologies, certainly there's a lot we can do to make it more seamless. Uh, a great example of an innovation that occurred during the pandemic was when we launched, uh, and, and this is uh, sort of a recent announcement as well, uh, the partnership with Nuance. And with Nuance, we had built a technology that uses AI to capture voice to text. It converts it into a, a, a clinical node and integrates it into the electronic health record. Well, <laughs> during the time that we announced it, a lot of visits were being done virtually. So we then quickly pivoted and integrated that into the virtual platform. And so during a team's consultation or a visit with a, a patient, now that full set of capabilities is enabled. And so now we're starting to think about, okay, so this isn't just about 
having a conversation and then going back to the typical workflow of typing it all in, we can actually start leveraging these tools that we today oftentimes have viewed as uh, things that were outside of the workflow, but are now embedded into a workflow that makes sense. And so this is just really the starting point for us, you know, thinking about all the different innovations that can occur to make the experience better and to elevate our ability to provide better care. So David, you're um, probably acutely aware that there's kind of uh, two significant uh, efforts going on in healthcare. One is, I would call it the uh, let's layer technology on the traditional bricks and mortar offering. And the other is let's develop health, new healthcare offerings that aren't based on bricks and mortar uh, un until perhaps the patient's requirements just absolutely demand that a bricks and mortar operation be involved. And I'm wondering how, how you view from Microsoft's perspective kind of sitting in the middle and serving both of those markets? Well, it, it does have to be a balance. Uh, there are clearly uh, organizations and industry needs that need to be fixed. And we think that some of the tools that we're developing uh, will help us do that. Um, but it's at the same time, building a path to reinvent the future. And, and that reinventing of the future uh, wasn't possible before, but we can start thinking about how we can expand care beyond those four walls of the hospital and clinic. Uh, we know we have good infrastructure in that. We can obviously do better, um, but clearly there's something there. But there's nothing there when you think about when an individual goes home and is 99% of the time managing their own care. Uh, they, they're, they're basically on their own. Uh, we may have opportunities to start thinking about how we can empower those individuals with technologies. There's a lot of visits and encounters that are, I'd say, missed opportunities for us to be able to start thinking about. So let me give you an example. If, if I were to, let's say, make a phone call to, uh, to schedule a, a clinic appointment, what will typically happen is during that encounter, uh, the, the individual will say, well, let me just either schedule you or connect you to the scheduler. It's, it's a very simple task, very easily could be automated. Now let's imagine a scenario where I'm an individual who's missed my last four appointments and there was a fire API that pulled out data from the EMR. It signaled that I was at high risk for actually having issues around transportation or perhaps uh, income due to the pandemic, or perhaps I don't even know how to do a virtual care visit. These are programs that oftentimes people have launched and built but people have not associated that during the time. It's the same concept that we talked about before. You know, we have great information, it sits on a shelf and unless people are able to access the information or the programs at the right time, it gets underutilized. And that's what we can start thinking about, leveraging every single member of the whole care team to be able to take advantage of decision support tools that are mobile, that are cloud enabled, that pull data directly from different sources and give us that ability to be able to provide better care. Do you, how, how do you weigh the, the opportunities at Microsoft between building and growing the platform and the tools that Microsoft offers versus the opportunities to have an open API uh, ecosystem environment to allow people to take teams and nuance and build off of that? Well, I think one of the things that we've been very focused on is not creating an closed ecosystem. We, we're, we're very much on the open. In fact, a lot of the things that we do, we, we build and then we make it open source. Uh, you know, we're all in favor of open standards. Uh, Fire is, is a great example. Uh, we, you know, build APIs. Uh, we are uh, really here to empower our organizations and our partners and the clients. Uh, I think that's probably one of the, the main uh, areas that we have made a, a significant pivot in the past, uh, you know, decade. It used to be all about, you know, trying to focus on technology first. It's now about empowerment, and to do that, we realize that we have to uh, take a back seat in many cases to what the priorities are. The priorities are for our clients and are for our the partners to be able to help better manage it. And we'll provide the infrastructure and support, but we're not, our goal isn't to take the data and, and analyze it or monetize it in any way, but we'll support it in ways that are very open, transparent, and allow us for a greater collaboration. David, what's, you know, you, you obviously see a lot of stuff. Microsoft's a company that probably gets a lot of uh, flow of ideas from uh, earlier stage companies through the door. What's on your wish list that you wish you had today that you could just deploy today, but you haven't seen yet? Well, we've actually got some technologies that I'd say, uh, similar to the voice AI with the nuance, 
are transformative. And I think in many ways, uh, in, in the spirit of continuing to partner with uh, organizations that have very specific use cases, we may be able to advance them much more rapidly. Uh, and as I think through some of the really exciting innovations, uh, you may have seen some work with HoloLens and you know, the, the, the extraordinary ability to, to use something called mesh. Uh, it is essentially creating a three-dimensional uh, real world environment that people can interact in. Now, it sounds like it's science fiction. It sounds like it's more for fun, but imagine a scenario where today in, in healthcare, and this is really true globally, uh, there's this concept of see one, do one, teach one. It's very limiting in terms of our ability to scale. Uh, we were just, I just heard uh, in the prior conversation, the, the fact that we're, we have a mismatch of supply and demand. Well, one of the issues today is the reason why we have that mismatch is it's very difficult to go through four years of med, med school and then another four years of internship and residency and then perhaps even another one around subspecialization. Uh, who has the time and, and the cost and the money to go invest in that? And when you look at countries, they have to build infrastructure around that. So the ability for us to be able to democratize care globally is going to require that we rethink how we deploy our knowledge and our skills. And with uh, a great example that uh, we've seen, uh, it was, a, it was a, a physician in Mount Sinai using the HoloLens with the uh, remote assist device uh, with a surgeon in Uganda, the Ugandan surgeon doing the actual surgery uh, live with the, the, the physician um, supervising. And the physician in uh, the, the Mount Sinai office was actually sketching out exactly where the incision needed to be made. And it was seen on the, the surface of the body of the, the patient because the, the surgeon in Uganda was using the HoloLens device. I mean, that's literally like bringing a person right there where you're at. This goes way beyond video conferencing, but it, it allows us to be able to, to do things that we've only envisioned in the past uh, as, as somewhat, uh, I'll call science fiction, uh, but it's reality. And it's something that we, as we think about how we scale, allows us to have greater impact. Yeah, David, uh, maybe just from the last minute, you would, uh, I know you joined us at Impact. I'm just, uh, from, from Microsoft's point of view and your personal point of view, what does Impact uh, do for you in the virtual first space? Well, I, you know, there's a couple of things that excite me. Um, one of them is just being able to create and deploy exciting and innovative technologies that allow us to be able to address big problems. But I'll tell you the other thing that gets me excited, and this is an area that I think technology can play a big role in, is addressing health disparities. Uh, we know that today, a lot of times what we create can be used only by a select number of individuals. But if we can democratize that and allow individuals to be able to have multiple different options of which one technology supports and enables, but also uh, you know, creates an, an inclusive environment. Uh, you know, the things that we've been doing around accessibility, um, you know, addressing issues that people may have related to poor vision, and, and my, my eyesight's actually getting um, worse, so I'm starting to feel having that category, poor hearing, uh, decreased mobility, decreased cognition. These are all individuals who need technology, and yet we've somehow, you know, in many ways, been moving so fast that we've forgotten about them. And, and so my, my super, uh, my passion is to figure out how we can create that inclusive environment where technology pushes us forward, but also is very inclusive and allows all of us to take a long a ride for that journey. It's a, it's, a great, it's a great vision and observation and obviously a huge opportunity to actually grow the market. So it's kind of a win-win for everybody in that scenario. Absolutely. Dan, uh, thank you for the opportunity to bring uh, David in to uh, the Hit Lab programming. No, it's uh, really our honor and uh, our pleasure. Thank you, uh, David and Don, both of you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it was a real pleasure. Thanks. <clears throat> uh, a, a terrific uh, presentation. I think one of the things that we're seeing uh, globally right now is a uh, this kind of push uh, on digital health and uh, the need to have new models and uh, new leaders pull it together is critical. And, and Dave, if you have uh, two more minutes, it would be great to understand from your perspective when looking at Microsoft, the HoloLens is an incredible opportunity, uh, but there are uh, so many different things that Microsoft is doing in healthcare, uh, whether it's the, you know, a lot of the, 
the, the systems that are being run uh, on fundamental email foundation layer, uh, et cetera. Um, what are some of the other, uh, maybe, you know, and, you know, things like nuance, like uh, purchasing nuance was a huge, huge uh, news in the healthcare system. Nuance is, uh, the, for those of you who don't know, it's the, the leading provider of natural language processing, uh, which in medicine, I don't know how many of you have tried to Google uh, your medical conditions uh, with either Siri or Google or Alexa, but um, uh, it's, it's very difficult. As, as you know, David, uh, physicians have a language, average vocabulary of about 240,000 words in their language. The average American has about 180,000 words. So that's where we see this fall off. Talk a little bit about some of the other things aside from the HoloLens that we're seeing in the uh, ecosystem and in Microsoft's ecosystem. Well, I'll tell you something that I, I spent a large part of my time on, and I think everyone uh, in the audience is thinking about as well, it's the pandemic. Um, I'm By way of background, I'm an infectious disease physician. So for me, there's, this was uh, very reminiscent of the things that we saw back in the AIDS era, but so much different as well. Uh, and, and what I've been recognizing is that while we oftentimes think of uh, this as being more of just a public health issue, uh, a societal issue. There's so much infrastructure that needs to be laid out that if we want to be able to address this pandemic more effectively now and in the future, that public health infrastructure needs to be built. And what we're doing right now is we're starting to recognize the core components of that. The things such as the role of testing and surveillance and genomic sequencing. How do we bring all that information seamlessly? A lot of this is around connecting the, the systems together, having them speak a common language all technology enabled, obviously, things that could technology could have a huge impact. How do we take that data, analyze, figure out where those next outbreaks or opportunities are? You know, obviously another area that AI can play a big role in. As we think about, you know, everything from the ability to identify those new variants and then think about R&D and how we accelerate that R&D for drug discovery and you know, different types of treatments. We're looking at the immune system now and, and their response and mapping that out. Again, another area where AI has a significant impact towards vaccinations, huge significant opportunity in vaccinations where we've realized that, you know, it's not just about providing mass vaccination sites, but it's about pop-up clinics that need to be pushed to communities that are underserved. How do we do that? Again, technologies that need to not only be effective in terms of capturing and scheduling, but it has to report out through the normal systems. And lastly, about this whole concept of when we return to work and return to school and return to travel, all of that, obviously things we can look at, maybe we've got a card that could help us do that. Maybe there's some kind of rules and policies, but technology can make that all seamless. So across the board, when you think of the pandemic, there's just so many areas where technology and infrastructure can play. Microsoft uh, has played a significant role in a large part of this, but really through partnerships and, and through understanding the needs and leaning in where we can help and pulling back when we think that we might be, um, you know, not necessary. So uh, yeah. it's really been about all of that. And, and for me, that's something that I think will persist well beyond this year and the next year, but will be a, a major factor for the ongoing years. Yeah, congratulations, David. Just really good work. And, and thank you for all the contributions.